Hello and welcome to another TLDR UK video. We've been hyping up May the 6th for a while now, talking about all the elections set to take place and what they could mean for Britain. At the weekend, we discussed Labour's poor performance in England's local elections, but in this video we're going to move out of England. We're going to be taking a look at the Scottish and Welsh elections, who did well, who did badly, and what it means for these countries as well as the Union as a whole. If you've been enjoying our election coverage and like our content, then consider backing us on Patreon. With your support, we've been able to expand TLDR, take on new staff, launch new channels and make more content. Not only do your donations help our vision for a better, more independent form of news, they also get you a whole bunch of perks. Learn more about what you can get by clicking the link to our Patreon down below. So, on Thursday, Scottish and Welsh voters went to the polls to choose their new National Assembly members. The first thing you need to know about these elections is that they both use an electoral system called the Alternative Members System, or AMS, where you get a constituency vote, as in the general election, and a regional vote. Regional votes are allocated using something called the De Haunt method, which basically just means that smaller parties like the Greens or Lib Dems, who don't get enough votes to win constituency seats, are compensated by the regional allocation. Anyway, enough about the system, let's start with Scotland. This election was particularly important for the future of Scotland, and well, the UK more generally, because the SNP are committed to a second independence referendum, otherwise known as Indy Ref 2, within the next two and a half years. And as we've discussed in previous videos, some recent polling has suggested that a majority of the Scottish public now support independence, which could mean that Indy Ref 2 would lead to Scottish independence. Anyway, there are 129 seats in the Scottish Parliament, which means that you need 65 for a majority. 73 of these are first-past-the-post constituencies, and the remaining 56 are regional seats. The SNP won 62 constituency seats, and two regional seats, with 40% of the regional vote, taking them to a total of 64 seats, just shy of a majority. The SNP saw a 1.2% increase in their constituency vote, up to 47.7%, and a 1.4% decrease in their regional vote, presumably thanks to Alex Salmon's ALBA, taking them down to 40.3%. Ultimately, the SNP were denied a majority, and this was in part because of unionist tactical voting in seats like Dumfrieshire and Dumbarton. So, what does this all mean for Indy Ref 2? Well, it depends who you ask. So let us be clear about what Scotland voted for on Thursday. The people of Scotland have voted to give pro-independence parties a majority in the Scottish Parliament. Both the SNP and the Scottish Greens stood on a clear commitment to an independence referendum within the next parliamentary term. And both of us made clear that the timing of a referendum should be decided by a simple majority of MSPs in the Scottish Parliament. There is no SNP majority and of course Nicola Sturgeon was asking for that to give her a a majority, a mandate to take forward another independence referendum and people across Scotland said no, they said they didn't want that SNP majority, they didn't want the government to go unchecked in this next parliament and that's why it's important for the main opposition party to ensure that we challenge the SNP and get the focus where I think people do want it, which is on our recovery. Essentially, unionists will tell you that this result is the end for Indy Ref 2, while nationalists will say that it's inevitable. In the spirit of neutrality, we're just going to present the unionist and nationalist arguments respectively and allow you to make up your own mind. Let's start with the nationalists. Nationalists will say that even if the SNP didn't win a majority, they were by far and away the largest party and that they were only stopped by tactical voting. Nationalists will also note that a majority of regional votes went to pro Indy Ref 2 parties, and that the Scottish Greens, who also supported Indy Ref 2, won eight regional seats, which means that there's now a pro Indy Ref 2 majority in the Scottish Parliament. The Unionists will respond that a pro Indy Ref 2 majority doesn't mean the majority of voters support Indy Ref 2, because people could have voted for the SNP and the Greens for non-constitutional reasons. And there's some evidence to support this. 
Polling done by Lord Ashcroft found that only 43% of Green voters supported independence. Unionists will also note that a majority of constituency votes went to parties who opposed Indy Ref 2. Unfortunately, Westminster parties can't really make either of these arguments, because as soon as they get a majority of MPs, they take that as a mandate for their whole manifesto, even if they only got 40% or so of the actual vote. This is why, if you ask Boris Johnson, he won't make a constitutional argument, he'll just say it's not the right time. Because ultimately, he's ruling with his manifesto without a majority of votes. Anyway, the point is that the SNP didn't win a majority, but nonetheless, there's a pro Indy Ref 2 majority in the Scottish Parliament. Not the worst result for Unionists, but definitely not a good one either. So what about Wales? Well, Wales has a total of 60 seats, which means that you need 31 for a majority. 40 of these are first-past-the-post constituency seats, and the remaining 20 are regional seats. Labour came first in Wales, winning 27 of the constituency seats and three regional seats for a total of 30, one more than last time in 2017. In fact, this was Labour's joint best ever performance in the Welsh Assembly elections. The Conservatives came second with eight constituency and eight regional seats for a total of 16, five more than in 2017. Wales is a particularly interesting case because both Labour and the Conservatives increased their vote share by about 5%. And this added 5% for each side seems to be down to UKIP, who won about 12% of the vote in 2017, but were down to about 1% this time round. We obviously can't know this for sure, but it seems relatively safe to assume that the 10 or 11% of Welsh voters who voted UKIP in 2017 have basically been split 50-50 between the Conservatives and Labour, hence their relatively equal 5-point swings. This is interesting, because UKIP and Brexit party voters have behaved differently in England, where it seems like a significant majority of them went for the Conservatives, and only a minority voted Labour, hence Labour's poor showing in the English council elections and in Hartlepool. We're not totally sure why this might be, but it's certainly an interesting inconsistency. As a final note, Scotland and Wales do slightly undermine the narrative that Labour did terribly and the Conservatives did brilliantly in this election. In Wales, Labour did the best they've ever done and successfully captured at least a significant fraction of old Brexit UKIP vote. In Scotland, nationalist parties won a majority, and it's fair to say that this must have been at least in part due to Boris Johnson's terrible approval ratings in Scotland. So while Johnson's Conservatives did very well in England, especially for an incumbent party, failed to stop the Nationalists in Scotland and could plausibly preside over the collapse of the Union. Equally, while Labour didn't do brilliantly in England, they did pretty well in Wales. And while we're talking about the whole Labour did badly in England thing, it's worth noting that they did still win 11 out of the 13 mayoral races and saw a three-point swing in vote share compared to 2019. We're interested what you think of this. Will Scotland continue to push towards Indy Ref 2? Is Wales a bright spot for Labour? And what do all of these results together mean for Johnson and the Conservative Party? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified every time we release a new video. Special thanks to our Patreon backers who make videos like this one possible. And if you want to see your name at the end of videos, then you too can back us on Patreon. The link to that is in the description.